What's up dudes, my name is Mike and I track a 95 Pontiac Firebird. In this video I'm going to go over my car setup in the past, present, and some plans for the future. My goal with this video is a quick rundown to help you make decisions when modifying your 4th gen F body for track days, so hopefully you'll learn from some of my mistakes. I see a lot of bad recommendations online with no lap times to back it up, so my intention here is to give you a formula to build a fast car without going bankrupt. The big question you're probably wondering, why trust me? Three things you should know up front. I've owned and modified my 96 Camaro for 13 years now, so I'm no stranger to this platform. I'm also a mechanical engineer by trade and I work in the automotive industry. And lastly, I've done a total of 28 track days so far, all of which have been in this car and it seems to be really fast for a shitbox. So let's get into it. Quick overview of the car's baseline setup when I got it in January of 2020. This car is in fact a Firehawk that was shipped with level 2 suspension, but a lot of the original parts had been swapped out by one of the many previous owners. The factory SLP Bilstein shocks and 32mm front sway bar are still in place. Somebody swapped out the factory SLP iBox springs for the iBox Pro Kit. If you're unfamiliar with the Pro Kit, it's an aftermarket lowering spring setup that's known for being too soft and saggy. The rear sway bar is a 21mm piece, and to be honest, I'm not really sure if this was factory or not. From what I could gather online, even if you had a Firehawk, it probably should have came with a 19mm sway bar, no different from a Z28 or a regular Trans Am. A couple of the rear suspension links had also been replaced with aftermarket spoon parts. The Panhard bar and LCAs had poly bushings, and the torque arm had been swapped for a shorter one. The car also had old Kenny Brown triangulated subframe connectors and the factory Firehawk wheels were missing. Instead, they were replaced by 17 by 9 WS6 wheels. My initial handling impressions of the car were that it was way too low, felt way too floaty, and the rear end was always very vague feeling. The Sumitomo tires were also hot garbage and they were ancient. I mean, I think the date codes were like from 2011 or something ridiculous like that. I bought this car with the intention of tracking it, but I knew I needed to start small since I'd never driven on a road course before. I figured autocross would be a good place to start and get my driving chops up, and this is also going to give me some time to get the handling where I wanted it to be. This car was a bit of a mess at first, especially when I compared it to my Camaro setup. The parts in red and green are my initial round of mods. The parts in red will ultimately get replaced, whereas the parts in green are still in the car as of July of 2024. First, the saggy iBox springs had to come out. I replaced them with a set of UMI springs with linear rates of 600 on the front and 200 on the rear. I also changed the sway bar to a 35mm hollow piece. The car immediately felt way tighter. There was still some vagueness to the rear end, so I added a rod-ended pan hard bar. The ride quality didn't really change all that much on the street, and the rear felt way more predictable, especially in a slide. The two-piece poly LCAs were swapped for three-piece poly ones that have a spherical ball at the center. These are allegedly supposed to articulate better than the two-piece ones, but I'll talk more about this later. I also swapped the torque arm out for a standard length UMI piece with the factory tail shaft mount. If you're unaware, short torque arms are more useful in drag cars since they raise the instant center out back and will give you more anti-squat. This means more bite under acceleration, but there's a higher risk of brake hop. The factory tail shaft mount isn't really a big issue with road racing because shock loads are way lower than that of a dry car. The crossmember mounted torque arms have a height adjustment at the nose, but I think this is a bit of a gimmick because it doesn't really change the instant center. For wheels, I swapped to 18 by 9.5 Corvette reps since tire choices are way better in 18 than they are in 17. I also got a deal on some 200 Treadwear Federal tires to learn on. Unfortunately, COVID prevents me from doing any autocross in 2020, but 2021 was a much better year for me. I ended up getting to do five or six events in the first half of the year, and I had a track day planned at the end of summer. I did notice there were a couple issues with the car I needed to address. The factory wheel hubs are chirping pretty bad from the grippy tires, and I know they're wearing very fast. My fix for this is to fit C7 wheel hubs to the front of the car using adapter brackets I designed. This setup wouldn't have ABS, but my ABS was already broken and I didn't want to deal with the dreaded ice mode scaring me on the track anyway. 
C7 hubs are also considerably cheaper than the X-Tracker setup. Also, my power steering develops an occasional whine out at autocross, and I know this is only going to get worse if I keep revving the piss out of the car. I install a March underdrive pulley set that spins the pump slower by about 30%, but it also overdrives the alternator so I don't have to deal with charging issues. I flush out the fluid with Redline and splice it to rally cooler into the return line. The brakes also felt awful and the fronts were certainly too small for track use. I did some research and decided that the CTS-V Brembo's made the most sense since the cost was about the same as the C5 upgrade and the performance was way better. I already had 18 inch wheels with plenty of spoke clearance, so fitment wasn't going to be an issue. This brake setup is a huge upgrade from the factory LT1 calipers and the pedal feel was way easier to modulate than before, but I still felt like there was something missing. It was still pretty difficult to recover after locking up the front tires, so I rigged up a master cylinder brace using some angle iron. This caught me off guard and the difference in pedal feel was about as drastic as the Brembo swap itself. Everything felt super firm and predictable from here on. I do a couple track days with this setup without any major hiccups, but then I start to make tweaks again. The rear end of the car had always felt pretty skatey and unforgiving since installing the UMI springs, almost like the rear end would unload a corner entry. I suspected that the 200 pound rate of the UMI springs was way too high for a stock roll center, so I swapped them out for BMRs with 160 pound rate. This really helps my confidence and the car feels way more compliant overall. I was also having trouble getting enough caster and camber at the same time with the factory camber slots ground out. I decided to try the Global West upper control arms and was able to keep the camber at negative 2 degrees, but was able to boost the caster from 3.5 to 5.5. I made my first trip to NJMP and then I started to notice oil control issues, specifically at turn 7 on Lightning, even with a quart overfilled. To solve this, I swapped out the stock oil pan for a Road Race Kevco version, and I added it to Rally Oil Cooler and Sandwich Plate while I was in there. So it's been about three years since my first track day and I've made a couple changes to the car. The initial track setup served me well and it was decent for racking up seat time, but ultimately I wanted to go faster. The Bilsteins are gone and I now have Ride Tech coilovers in the front and Coney Yellows out back. Both of these have a single rebound adjustment, but I rarely adjust the rears. I do soften up the fronts for street driving though. You might be thinking that the 800 pound front spring is too high compared to the 160 pound rear, but there's an important reason for this. The foam bump stop on the factory style struts an active part of the suspension when cornering, and the travel's pretty limited on these. This makes the front end feel like it has progressive springs when the stop contacts the strut body. On the other hand, some coilover bump stops are relocated and rarely ever make contact, so the front spring rate needs to be increased to get the same roll stiffness. Even though the spring rate's way higher than your typical 550 or 600 pound F-body spring, I find that these coilovers ride better on the street since I'm not constantly hammering the stock bump stops like I was with the Bilsteins. 
I also found that the ride height was way too low with the UMI springs, which only made things worse. For LCAs, I noticed that the three-piece poly arms would occasionally bind and cause snap oversteer, especially during lift. The outer poly cups were soft at first, but eventually hardened with time. I considered going back to stock LCAs with rubber bushings, but I decided against it since they increased the probability of wheel hop or brake hop. I went full race car instead with rod-ended LCAs, and the rear is much more predictable now, although I will say the ride is pretty harsh on the street. I also went with wider wheels, and I'm currently on 285 Bridgestones. Quick side note on that, 315s are way too wide for a 10.5 inch wheel on a road course. This might be fine for autocross, but they're way too squishy and unsettling at high speeds. Eventually, the stock posi felt a little too loose for my liking. It would lock up in a burnout, but you could definitely feel the rear end rotating around under throttle mid-corner. The back end wasn't really sliding per se, but you could feel the back end going a little wider than the front. I swapped in a cheap Yukon posi and it's been great ever since. As far as longevity mods go, I ditched the Kevco pan in favor of a champ one. I noticed some occasional oil starvation as my pace increased, so I needed something better. The new pan is deeper, has better partitioning, and more trap doors than before. I added some reinforced sway bar brackets and a diff girdle since they were pretty cheap in the grand scheme of things. I pulled the ABS block and added a prop valve to get better control over my brake bias. If this is your first track build and you're unfamiliar with track cars in general, getting your brake bias right is super important for trail braking and overall stability, especially if you need to apply the brakes while turning for whatever reason. I found that a medium to high friction pad on the front with a low friction pad on the rear has worked really well for my brake setup, even with the factory prop valve in place. Last year I made a Lexan spoiler and swapped in my Roadmaster's mild heads cam mode. I highly recommend getting some aero on the rear of these cars as they feel way more stable in high speed corners. So I'm really happy with the car's current setup, but I do have a couple plans for the future to kick it up a notch. The first and most obvious thing is safety equipment, because I desperately need a roll bar and harnesses. This car is way too fast for being this old, and it definitely is in my best interest to not die like James Dean. You've got to remember that this car has no ABS, no driver aids of any kind, and no airbags. Beyond that, I'm building up a 355 engine on the side with a larger cam, LE2 heads, ported intake, and higher compression, hopefully to get the power up to around 400 wheel horsepower. This motor should be happy to rev up to 6500 all day long and I won't have to short shift anymore. I'd also like to swap to wider 18x11 spec Corvette wheels and a wider 315 Nankang CRS tire down the road. I want to do a little bit of experimentation with the rear suspension geometry too. Specifically by that I mean I want to lower the rear roll center down with the watt slip. If I lower the roll center slightly, this should allow me to reinstall those 200 pound UMI springs and keep the same roll stiffness out back and cornering, but I should have less lift under braking and less squat under acceleration. My only real criticism with the car is that it doesn't trail brake very well because of all the motion in the rear end, but I'm really hoping this should help it out. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for making it to the end. If you liked this video and it helped you out, be sure to drop a comment, smash the like button fam, hit the subscribe button, share the video with your friends, your family, your mom, your dad, strangers you meet on the street, even your therapist. I'm sure they love it. But seriously, I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, content like this is pretty niche and it's really difficult for me to get any sort of exposure regardless of how much effort I put into it. Maybe I should just start making clickbait. Alright, peace.